Welcome back, everybody. So you know our next guest as the social's resident wine expert, but today she is here in a different capacity as an author. Her deep, her deep and personal memoir, Wine Witch on Fire, is about divorce, defamation, and drinking too much. Please join us in welcoming Natalie McLean back to the show. There's only one way to say congratulations mm. on your new book, Natalie, and that is with a toast. So Excellent. ladies, all right. Ladies. <laughs> oh, uh, cheers. A little cheers. Mine is not alcoholic, so thank you to our producers right. for that. And cheers, cheers on your new book. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, huge congratulations. Uh, Wine Witch on Fire is the title, yes. and such a fitting title. The theme of witches is sort of woven throughout the book. So what is it about the idea of the witch that resonates and resonated so deeply mm -hmm. with you? Well, you might think from the title, Wine Witch on Fire, this is about an angry woman who drinks a lot of wine and owns a lot of cats. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's not. There's humor and there's a happy ending, spoiler alert. But witches really resonate with me because their power comes from within not from external validation. And so my favorite childhood stories were always about witches. So The Wizard of Oz, Glinda the Good Witch, and The Wicked Witch of the West. Yeah, she was good, badass. <laughs> um, but, you know, I realized that over time, some stereotypes of women can be damaging. And I think it really is time that we take back that word witch. Yeah. And for me, what it means is a wise woman who's been through the flames and comes out the other side stronger, wiser and fiercer. Yeah. <laughs> so the story of the book focuses on a certain period in your life, but it's not linear. You jump right. around a little bit and there is a, a, an inciting incident that you start with. Can you talk about what that fallout was from it? Sure. So it was um, just before Christmas, around midnight, when my nightmare before Christmas started. <coughs> Excuse me. And. I was checking email one last time before going to bed and this Google alert popped up and it said, Natalie McLean, world's best wine writer or content thief? Oh yeah, oh. have another drink. <laughs> um, but you know, it was just, it was so devastating because it's the worst thing you can be accused of as a writer, right? Yeah. So my heart dropped and the words were blurring in and out the text and I clicked through to this large American wine and spirit site and there was a, a long post about me and uh, won't go down the legal rabbit hole, but I was the first to respond uh, as a comment on the post. And I explained that what I was doing, quoting other reviews was within the bounds of fair use, fair dealing. Um, but uh, that didn't matter. <laughs> that, so the accusation ignited the spark, but the bonfire really started blazing when the trolls started to focus on me as a woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, that devolved to taking my body apart piece by piece in public and discussing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, go for a drink. Um, <laughs> but, um, and then it spread, because that was juicy stuff, right? It spread to other websites and newspapers around the world from South Africa to New York. And um, some would say, oh, well, just turn it off. It's the internet. But, you know, when you earn your living online, you can no more turn it off than a surgeon can operate outside a hospital. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, and you talk about this online defamation at yep. length in the book, but you also talk about your divorce mm -hmm. when your husband of 20 years just sort of seemingly left without a reason. <laughs> um, so you are a wine person. You are a public person as well. Was it difficult to make the decision to share such personal information? It was. It was. <laughs> you know, for the first five years that um, I, I couldn't look at the notes, this was 10 years ago. Um, I just couldn't look at them. And, uh, but the story kept ricocheting around in my mind so long that I had to let it out on paper, at least as a private exercise to make sense of what had happened. Um, but then over the years, I started hearing more and more stories from women in the wine industry, which is really clubby and has a very active social grapevine. And the stories, the themes were the same. And then women friends in other fields, tech, sport, finance, same stories. And so I thought, can, can my story help? Um, but I was inspired by memoirist Glennon Doyle, who said, write from a scar, not an open wound. Mm. And so then you might think, well, why write about it at all after the healing is done, right? But um, poet Sean Doherty said, because somewhere, someone out there has a wound 
in the exact shape of your words. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thank you. You also shared, you know, very vulnerably that you felt like you were drinking too much during mm. part of this uh, experience. What, what what was it that made you realize you were over consuming and how did you start moderating your alcohol consumption? So first of all, a lot of therapy, um, which is in the book and uh, early readers are appreciating that. But, um, you know, I live or I work surrounded by wine. Uh, you might consider that, you know, paradise, but it's a professional duty for me to be drinking and tasting wine. And industry stats show that the wine industry has the highest rate of substance abuse because it is so accessible. Um, so there's a lot of shame, professional shame, in even admitting you have a problem or not keeping up. Mm. And so first I had to deal with what I call the arsenic hour. And that is around 5 p.m. when there's a natural dip in your serotonin, the happy hormone, uh, that makes you want to either take arsenic or administer it to someone. <laughs> um, <laughs> <and> so, <laughs> or have a glass of wine. Uh, so first I had to say, what was the thought just before the thought that said, I need a drink? Mm -hmm. And was it about stress or enjoyment? And if it was about stress, was there another way to handle it? Like, go, go for a walk have a bath, watch a show. You know, and then I had, I have all kinds of other tips sprinkled throughout the book. But another one that really helped was a full bottle of wine, pour half of it into a half empty bottle. Then you can save it, it's fresh for another day and you're more mindful of how you drink mm -hmm. and how much you're consuming. So there's lots of tips like that. Yeah. Oh gosh, you're speaking my language, <laughs> speaking my language. Now throughout the memoir, you describe what you call slick and sexist marketing mm. that is geared towards women. Yes. What does that mean? So the message on some bottles is that we're either babes or battle axes. So we're either going for brands like Stiletto or Little Black Dress, or we're just trying to obliviate another day of exhaustion with mummy juice or mummy's timeout. But the implied message is that women need a reason to drink. So we're getting together with girlfriends or it's a fancy occasion or we're just getting through another day. Whereas wine is not marketed to men like that. A man has a drink because he wants a drink. No one asks yeah. him why. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. what's the occasion? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think some of these labels power from profit, uh, from powerlessness. Mm -hmm. And so I think we just need to be more mindful of the wines we're buying and drinking. Mm -hmm. And now you say that you recognize your culpability mm -hmm. in promoting gendered wine messaging um, in your writing. So what were you doing then and what are you doing now? Mm -hmm. So even in tasting notes, wines are described often as masculine or feminine. So feminine means easygoing, accessible, light and frivolous. Masculine means complex, structured, mm -hmm. full body. Interesting. Yeah, and you think about the wines, rosé, prosecco, you know, that kind of thing are, are women's wines. Um, but the message is that somehow feminine wines are not serious. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was, you know, I wasn't a bystander in the labeling game, I was team captain. So I used to call my glass at 5 p.m. mommy's little helper, you know? And it's, no one was thanking mommy for another day, so mommy will thank herself with another drink to get through it. And, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, looking back now, I can see all of this, but it, it, it's really hard to read um, the label from inside the bottle. The book is so good though, Natalie. It is Cute. such a great read. Sorry. Well, let's grab these. Okay. Another huge congratulations to you. Um, it is called Wine Witch on Fire. It is available now. Get yourself a copy. And studio audience, you're going home with your copy today. Thanks for watching. We've got lots more discussion and debates on everything from food and fashion to pop culture and current events. Don't forget to click like and subscribe.